Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining today's webcast, uh, Data at Risk. Uh, my name is Jamie Draper. I'm a partner with PricewaterhouseCoopers in our uh, security risk and controls practice, specializing in those areas. And for those of you who have joined these webcasts before, thank you very much for continuing to support us. For those uh, who are joining for the first time, welcome, and hopefully you'll get a lot of benefit from this and join the future webcasts and we'll talk about some of those uh, those webcasts at the end. Um, so we're, we're bringing you or trying to bring you content around security and controls as it relates to SAP. And today we're going to talk about data at risk and look at how you how you analyze your, your data and go about looking at sensitive access. I'm joined today by Pete Hobson and Valerie Lichter. I'll give those uh, a more detailed introduction in a minute before we get into the actual detail of the presentation. But first, I need to go through some administrative matters. So the first thing I need to do is read through a disclaimer. And for those of you who have been on the webcast before will know this. This is specifically to our um, external audit clients to remind them of services that we can and cannot provide. So certain matters reviewed today may represent services that PwC may be prohibited from providing to our audit clients. In those instances, the information is being provided to inform you of options that you may want to consider as you evaluate the solution to described on today's webcast. Due to the complexity of independence rules, any potential services for our audit clients should be discussed in advance within the context of the independence rules. The information contained in this document is provided as is for general guidance on matters of interest only. PricewaterhouseCoopers is not here and engaged in rendering legal accounting, tax, or other professional advice and services. Before making any decision or taking any action, you should consult a, comp a competent professional advisor. And the next thing that I want to go through from an administrative standpoint is about the webcast itself. So just some general tips for better viewing experience, close other applications. And for better sound quality, headphones tend to work a little bit better. You can enlarge the slides by clicking on the button uh, on the right corner of the slide window and drag it to the size that you want to. The question we get asked, and I'm sure I'll get asked it midway through as well, um, is, is, is the presentation available? Yes, it is. You can download today's presentation. You can click on the resources widget at the bottom of the screen, and you should see the option to download. Um, we do encourage everybody to participate and submit questions. There's a Q&A function. Uh, it's likely we won't get to every Q&A during this session, uh, but we will answer every question we get through follow-up if we don't get to answer it here. Um, one thing I will say, if we get a question related to a specific client circumstance, we're obviously not going to answer that in, in the public forum. We tend to try and answer questions that are of general interest. And lastly, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties during the polling session, Reply to the questions in the Q&A window with a, poll, uh, with a poll number, and this is relating to the next slide, which talks about the CPEs. So if, if you end up with technical difficulties, you can just reply and still get your CPEs. So with regard to the CPEs, um, you need to stay online for the entire 60 minutes of the, uh, of the webcast. You need to respond to the polling questions, as I said. And as I said, if you do have technical difficulties you, you know, on the actual screen itself, you can respond through the chat. Uh, you need to click on the CPE widget at the end of the webcast, which is located at the bottom of the screen, and then follow the prompts. Uh, and lastly, uh, this webcast will be recorded and will be put online. But unfortunately, we can't give CPE credits for people who are watching, uh, listening to a, a replay or if you're uh, not logged on as yourself or if you're in a, if you're in a group. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to move into the presentation. As I said uh, just before I click to, to, the, to the agenda, I'm joined by Valerie Lichter and Pete Hobson. So Valerie is a manager in our Chicago practice. She's got six years of experience helping companies secure, and manage, secure manage, and monitor sensitive data within SAP. And most importantly, she's recently led an effort to reduce, or as an example of what she's done, she's led an effort to reduce the sensitive access in a financial close process of, of one of our clients. This has resulted in a 25% decrease in users with sensitive access and has really helped clean up uh, and improve the, the, the way that data is being secured in that organization. Pete is a director out of our New York office. Pete has over 10 years' experience 
Uh, Pete's also done one of these webcasts with me before, so he, he's a professional now. Um, so Pete's got over 10 years' experience um, working with SAP security and helping companies secure uh, data. And one of the projects Pete's worked on recently, he's helped a company complete an exercise of identifying, identifying and locating sensitive data related to their bill of materials and recipes. And we're going to see some of those examples as we walk through this webcast. So both Valerie and, uh, Valerie and Pete sorry, are going to be bringing uh, these, these examples to this webcast and, uh, and making them real. So with that, I'm going to move on to the agenda and let Valerie walk through the details. Uh, so Valerie. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Um, thank you, and thank you everyone for joining. We're really excited about this topic today, so let's get started. As you can see on the agenda, we really wanted to start with what is data risk and why is it important? There are so many different um, meanings or implications for data for sensitive access, and we, we'd like to narrow the focus down in that first section. And then we'll get into more of understanding and managing your data risk, as well as highlight um, several success stories uh, focusing really on what went well and then talking through what could have done better, what could have gone better on some of those projects. So with that, I'll start out the first section. So again, we wanted to start the conversation by defining our focus for today. Um, we hear the word risk used often, um, and we really wanted to start with talking about a general definition. So what is risk according to the dictionary? Um, this is the possibility that something bad or unpleasant will happen, someone or something that may cause something bad or unpleasant to happen, and so forth. You get the idea. Um, what is risk in its most basic form? A really simple example of this. Uh, what transportation did you use today? Was it a plane, a bus, a car, a motorcycle? We make risk decisions every day. So how does this relate to the business and data risk that you may be worrying about? Risk could be the possibility that something bad happens due to the recipe for your core product being released. Something that may cause something unpleasant to happen, like your vendor seeing the pricing markup on his product. This could cause a difficult conversation. Or it's a person or thing that someone judges to be a bad choice, like a company with which to store credit card information. Either you have a good reputation for that or a bad one. So I hope this helps frame uh, what we really want to get into today from a data risk perspective. Now let's get into a few key statistics. How prevalent are data risks today? Um, why is this important and why is it important now? Just to walk you through a few of these, information security risks have increased 48% in the last year. 22% of small businesses suffered staff-related security breaches. So this could be from the outside or it could be an accidental or intentional breach from the inside. What I find really interesting is 70% of organizations keep their worst security incident under wraps. This makes sense. Unless there's a reason that they, a company feels like they should or they have to disclose those types of security breaches, they won't want to. More important than how prevalent these data risks are as well is why is this happening? Why is it pertinent now? Um, one of the major megatrends we talk about often as an organization is globalization. So there are new market pressures to share information across the world. So that could be anything from distributing supply chains, global engineering, HR information, um, and really operating a business globally means you need to share that information at times. And then secondly, there's a new regulatory emphasis on data protection. Due to all the data that is being shared, we also on the other side want to protect that. So that's things like personally identifiable information or PII or international traffic and arms regulations or ITAR. So these are just a few of examples of how prevalent data risks are and why it's important at this point in time. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jamie for the first CPE question. Thanks, Valerie. So as I mentioned, in order to get CPE, you need to answer all these CPE questions. Our first question, does your organization currently have data at risk concerns? A, yes, and we have good measures currently in place to protect data at risk. B, yes, but we're not comfortable with our level to control these concerns. 
C, no, we don't have concerns. D, I'm not sure, tell me more. Um, and I, I'll leave this question up for a minute to allow people to answer that. Um, and typically speaking on these webcasts, what we do is answer any of the questions that come in by chat. I'm actually going to ask a question that was um, was sent to us prior to the webcast because I think it was a, it's an important question uh, that I got from one of our clients that's implementing SAP right now. And that question uh, I'll pose to you, Valerie, um, uh, as Pete's not had the opportunity to speak yet. Um, during an implementation, an SAP implementation, when do we need to start thinking about data concerns? Okay. Thanks, Jamie. That's a good question. Um, the answer really is as soon as possible. So with a lot of our clients, if we come in after the fact on an implementation, uh, that makes it extremely difficult because even things like security uh, protection, it's dependent on how you set up your configuration and your data on SAP. We'll actually get into that more um, as we get into further content in one of the success stories. But if you can start having those conversations, thinking about your framework for data risk early in an implementation or an upgrade project, um, that will really help guide decisions throughout the course of that project. And as soon as you have the handle on some of the business processes that you'll have in SAP, this will help you start to think about okay, I'm using production, do I have sensitive access in that area? And then, especially if you're needing any customization, um, any third parties that you may want to consider to help you protect your data, at the start is really the best time to think through that. Okay, thanks, Valerie. Um, I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty. I can't seem to preview the answer from the screen that I've got. So in the interest of sticking to time, I'm going to move on. Um, unfortunately, I can't do an analysis of those results. Oh, hold on. No, it's me that's made the mistake. Uh. Okay, um, I'm not sure if you can see the answer, but the majority of people have answered yes, um, that they've, it's, it's answer A, yes, that they've got uh, good measures in place to present data at risk. Uh, the second most popular is, is that they've got, that they're comfortable uh, with a level of control over these concerns. Uh, sorry, they're not comfortable with a level of uh, controls over these concerns. Thank you. Somebody just pushed that to the audience. Um, so I think um, th that that's interesting. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll move on. I, I was expecting most people to uh, acknowledge that they do have data at risk concerns. I'm pleased that there's a high percentage of people that are com currently happy that they've got they've got this under control. Um, so with that, I'm going to move it on to the next slide. Um, as, yep. And so I'm going to hand over to Pete to talk a little bit more about risk. Thanks very much, Jamie. Uh, so Val did a lot of, you know, talked a lot about what is risk and how prevalent it is. Uh, then the next logical question is, so what? Why does this matter? Uh, so to, to answer that question, PwC actually did a survey on information security breaches. And what we found was actually very interesting. Over the last few years, we've seen the cost and scale of these types of breaches double. So each breach is now costing twice as much as it used to. What you're also seeing is that there's a bigger impact on your financial losses of the average breach. So anytime something of this does occur to you, one of it is the cost to fix it, and there's also the, the downstream impacts uh, on your financials. And so really what you're seeing is it, it's a big risk, not it's a cost perspective. There's also a lot of things that it can impact you on. So if you move ahead to the next slide, what you're going to see is there's a lot of different impacts of data security. We think the best way to put this on the table is to give an example. If you take a look at the music industry, the music industry is someone that's experienced an awful lot of change over the last several years, and a lot of that can be traced back to the security and control over its intellectual property, which was the music. If you look back at, you know, go back 10 years, you had CDs. And then there was the introduction of MP3s. So what happened is in the past, the music industry used to have control of its content by selling CDs to people, and that was its major, one of its major revenue streams. What happened was 
I, you know, those CDs were now being able to take by individuals, and they were able to pirate that information and put that into MP3, MP3s and distribute that freely to customers without charging anybody. And so what ends up happening is the music industry is really stuck in a spot where, well, now we don't have control over IP, and, and so what they're running into is a lot of different impacts. They're losing money because they're selling less CDs. They're getting increased costs because now they have litigation fees to go chase down the people that are either sell, you know, either pirating the music or redistributing it. And then finally, there's an awful lot of costs to refine their business model. Now that they've lost this revenue stream and don't have control of it, they need to find new ways to bring that money back and bring back in customers. And so these types of breaches, I think that's a great example of one type of thing, if your information gets set out, how there's impact short-term, long-term, both on your, your immediate financials, your long-term viability, and basically your entire business model to make sure that you remain my, viable in the, within the industry. And so it's just, it, it kind of speaks to the importance of why do you need to manage data and why is it so important to protect your information, protect your intellectual property, and take the necessary steps to make sure that you're protected. Okay, thanks, Pete. So now we'll get into section two. Hopefully, um, so far you've got a, a better idea of what type of data concerns we're speaking to and how prevalent they are, and, and most importantly, why that's important, the so what question that Pete referred to. So now let's get into the million dollar question. What does sensitive mean to your organization? This is the first question you should ask yourself when you're thinking through data risk, um, when you're thinking about what you need to do as a company to protect yourself. The important thing to note here is that not all organizations will have the same type of sensitive security concerns. For one organization, it could be related to data, but for another, it's an end-to-end -end process. Um, or for others, specific industry regulations apply that you need to be aware of. Um, and it, it could be different across industries. So you have chemical, which with product specifications, versus retail, consumer product, food or beverage recipe, or governance or nuclear regulations. So you'll see here on this slide that we've laid it out, you know, across the top we've got more of the production related concerns, bills of materials, recipes, then moving into engineering, product specifications. Then from either a consumer or a services industry, your prices, your margins, what's sensitive there. And then getting into more of personal data, um, HR information, and it's something that affects all companies, the financial close data. So again, the first question to ask yourself is what is sensitive to us? And this will drive your process of finding out where it is in SAP and coming up with ways to protect it. What I'd add to you, Val, is just, I, I always find it so interesting with this question about how unique and custom what sensitive is to each and individual organization. You know, there's, there's some that I would consider to be more common. How do you create your products, whether it's the recipes or the design specifications? But then sometimes there's things that are so unique that you may not even think of them. I remember I had a client that was particularly concerned about its employee address information, which on the surface, I understand you don't want to get that out. Um, but their reasoning was very specific. They had a production line that was, that was independent, and they were concerned about the, uh, the potential of it unionizing. And so what their concern was is if that employee address information got out to the wrong hands, these union people could go reach out to the employees and start an effort to unionize uh, you know, their production line. And they saw a lot of downstream impacts and costs of that if that were to happen. So I just thought, you know, that one just was, to me was always so unique. It's just, it, it's very, uh, something you may not typically associate with it, but something that's very, very real as far as sensitivity. And so that's why you really have to go through this exercise to ask yourself the question of what's really meaningful to me, what's sensitive to me based on my business and, and what events I want to happen and not happen. Thanks, Pete. That's a great example. Moving on, as Pete was saying, you know, the first step is figuring out what is sensitive to you. And, and as Pete mentioned, that could be something very specific or it could be something more general. But I think this slide really illustrates some of the typical drivers for data risk management. Um, so starting with the left here, we've got data. This is such a common word. It can mean so many different things. But really, it's any information stored in your SAP system which you would consider sensitive. Is it public information? Is it private? Do you want your vendors or your customers to see it? Um, is it a display issue? Does certain data need to be restricted across different parts of the world for your company? Um, and it really can be something as simple as pricing or as complicated as how to build a weapon. But this one alone, this data piece, could have widespread impacts for your company. So that's, it's a good starting point. Um, 
it, it could even be something like an employee who's leaving taking confidential bomb data. So again, it can be an external threat or an internal threat in the data, data world. Moving on to intellectual property, um, this is something that legitimately puts your business at risk. So it's not just you don't want it to happen, but this would really change you know, the nature of your business if this were to be leaked. Um, so first question, does your company have intellectual property? Um, and how much is it worth to you? Do you have a trade secret recipe? Um, it's a total loss of your business differentiator if this type of information could get out. You also have to consider what else you store in that system. So do you store the IP of your clients? That's something to consider. Uh, or you know, what measures are you taking to protect your IP, that of your clients here? Do you have anything to add on that one, Pete? No, Val, I think you did a really nice job summing up a lot of the different directions. It's that, you know, it, there's just there's so many different sources or reasons why you need to take care of this, right? And so it's always going back to that question of, you know, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? And also thinking through about, you know, once you get into that, realizing that it can be both external threats but even internal threats, like you said. Great. Next, you can think through more specific regulatory um, data impacts, so regulations. Starting with the first, PII. This stands for Personally Identifiable Information. And it really comes up through U.S. privacy law, but there is no standard definition for PII, so this can make it interesting for different types of companies. Pete already brought up the home address example. Um, other examples include your name, social security numbers, credit card numbers, payroll. For different industries, um, you know, some of this data may be more important or less important and can have damaging implications. Um, and it, payroll information just is one example I've, I've seen at a client where during the course of the implementation, they forgot to secure the payroll information. Luckily, they only had a few examples in there, but it's an example of how even display access can be highly sensitive and something you need to restrict. And then moving on to ITAR, International Traffic and Arms Regulations. This is one that's defined by the U.S. Department of State and is really meant to safeguard national security. Um, so, so beyond just wanting to be compliant, how much would it cost your business if you had a lawsuit for not complying with some of these requirements? Uh, maybe on your legacy system you have ways to protect this, some custom solutions, but you didn't consider it during your SAP implementation. This is one I've seen where if you don't start at the very beginning, um, this can have impacts on, on how well you're able to manage that security and data risk if you don't consider it from the start. Um, in setting up your master data and setting up your configuration. But of course, you also have to keep in mind, you know, balancing your risk with your operation. So that's something that can be a struggle, but a balance that's, that's worth finding. And finally, lastly, sensitive processes. So we talk a lot about data, and this can be master data, it can be specific um, pieces of, of information within your system, but you also can have sensitive end-to-end -end processes if, if that's part of your competitive advantage. So supply chain, for example. Um, another example is financial close. So how many people can open and close your posting period? This seems like such a simple access point. Um, you can get through it to, with transaction codes, with tables, but this could lead to misstated financials. So a small access point, huge impact. Um, and think through if there's a process that's specialized your company or your industry, or even something as simple as have there been consistency or errors in a particular process, you really want to understand you know, who has access to do the, the different pieces in the process and what are we doing to make sure that those people are able to do their jobs effectively. So with that, I will turn it over to Jamie for the second CPE question. Thank you, Valerie. So the second CPE question we've got, um, what percentage of your SAP user base can access your sensitive data? A, less than 15%, B, between 15 and 50%, C, greater than 50%, D, I'm not sure, how do I find out? Um, so I'll give you a minute to, to answer that question. And going to the Q&A chat, Pete, I'm going to put you on the hot seat this time as I, as I put Valerie on the hot seat last time. Um, a question that's come in, is there a gold standard configuration of the SAP application and the related database and operating system and other services, uh, other ser server configuration? No, thank you, Jamie. That's, that's really an excellent question. Uh, 
Gold standard, no, I would say. Uh, SAP is one of those things you can configure so many ways in so many different, different directions, both within the application as far as how you configure it, but also what databases you run, what database and operating systems you run it on. What I'd say is that there's a gold standard, of, you know, there's, there's an approach that you want to look at these things, right? Because I think what you want to, the, the biggest advice I give people around this is make sure you're looking at the whole picture and you're looking at it up front from the big, beginning as much as possible. Because what you get with SAP with this data protection is that there's many ways to do it. You have to put your right protections on the operating system, the right ones on the database level, and within the application you have all sorts of different ways that you can do it through application security roles, configurable controls, process design, manual checkpoints. You have all these things at your disposal to be able to come up with a very good, very comprehensive, and very secure model. So what you want to do is take a look at all those different things that you have available to you Understand what your risks are, where they exist, and then go ahead and put in those different layers and controls to make sure that you're adequately protected. Great, Pete. Thanks for taking that. So, um, if we uh, if if we look at if if we can look at the poll results, um, what what we'll see is that. Uh, the, the, the answer to the question or the, the, what we're coming back with is, is this answer D, I'm not sure how do I find out. Um, th th that doesn't surprise me uh, too much because I think that, that uh, as we go through this, this webcast, I think people will kind of get a better understanding of what sensitive data is and, and, and I'm thinking a few people will have an aha moment and, and sort of realize this is a bit, a bit more complicated a topic than it, than it first seems. Um, to, to, to those um, who think that it's less than 15%, hopefully you're right. Um, my question would be, are you sure you're right? <laughs> um, I don't know, Peter or Valerie, if you've got anything you wanted to add to that. Yeah, no, I think, Jamie, what I would say is that you know, this, this lines up nicely with what I see at my client sites, right? The people that know what their sensitive data is tend to have a good understanding of how broad their exposure is. I think with D, if I'm looking at this, what I'm seeing with that, a lot of people, the reason why they don't know what their exposure is is because they don't actually know what their sensitive data is. Or if they do, it's very piecemeal and limited. You know, a lot of people say we monitor PII and that's about it. And so I think it really leads nicely into where Val and I were going to go next uh, on this slide, which is talking about, so I'm not sure, how do I find out? Well, let's talk to you a little bit about the processes that we've used and how people have evaluated this and identified it in the past. Great, thanks. And I think that's a great lead-in to, to Valerie to start talking about this next slide, identifying and securing uh, and monitoring the access. Great, thank you, Jamie. So I love this slide personally. This this really encompasses the crux of what we're talking about today, and, and I'll be walking you through each step in detail here. So to start, identifying, securing, and monitoring. These are words we use all the time. Seems like a very broad sweep and maybe too simplistic of a way to look at this. But when you get into these five steps, you'll see that each one is critical. Missing a step or not completing one before moving on in the process can really cripple your attempt to secure data. And we've seen this at clients again and again, starting at different steps or not really you know, thinking through the process as a whole. Um, so I'd, I'd like to walk you through these in detail. Starting with the framework, this is the most critical step in the process to avoid boiling the ocean, as they say. So we really can't tackle everything at once. Um, but what's most important for your company and for your organization is to think through the framework of what is sensitive to you. So I know we, we've said that time and again. We've talked about some of the typical drivers. So brainstorm. This is your chance to think through what is sensitive, um, what do we really want to protect. Yeah. And Val, I would add, I mean, it seems so simple, but it really comes down to if you don't know what's sensitive, how can you possibly protect it, right? Mm -hmm. I'd also add on this one, right? I mean, I know the focus of what we're talking about today is SAP. But when you're establishing these frameworks, a lot of clients, what we recommend to them is, is don't just keep it solely to SAP. This data exists a lot of places across your application framework. So when you're talking sensitivity and, and what's sensitive to you, always consider at the broadest level, you know, what is it across the framework, and then you start tracing it down into the application. I think Val is going to talk a little bit more about that. Yep, exactly. Um, a couple more points just on this framework piece as well. 
one of the things I've seen in clients is that if someone makes this decision, okay, we're going to do this project and this is the scope of it. It's truly important to get buy-in from the leadership down to those business stakeholders. Uh, one thing we've seen go wrong here is not you know, putting in the investment of time, not thinking through the people that you'll need to get this done, not getting the dollars um, to have the project go from start to finish. So it's really identifying who has the knowledge, getting the right people involved, making that investment and, and seeing the, the projects from start to finish. So again, this piece is the most critical to scope the project. Yeah, I think, Val, I would add one thing to that. It's a lot of times when we see people start these efforts, it's not at step one, it's over at step four. You say, I need to reduce exposure to PII. I need to reduce how many people have access to that. And it, what that does is, yeah, it, in the moment, you probably take care of that problem, but what you get into is this constant solution and update and solution and update, and you're, you're constantly changing things because you haven't considered what else is there and how that might have a, a downstream impact on the solution that you implement overall. That's great. Thank you. Moving on to the second step, this is policy. So this is where you set the vision. We know what we consider sensitive. How are we going to govern this? What do we want to do with now what we know is sensitive data? Um, what are some of those key performance indicators that you're looking at? Again, this is before you even get into all of the places that data may be, but it's making the decision of how you want to handle it. Um, what is the appetite for risk across the company? So this can be even something as simple as sensitive access reporting in GRC, which um, some of the clients on the line may or may not um, do this already, but you have the rule set defined, you have your framework, and the logical groups are set up to define the location of which systems are considered sensitive, and now you have this report. Um, the policy really helps you define what do I do with it. It guides you through the so what of all of that data that you're, that you're seeing there. Yep. No, it's definitely it's a lesson learned. I've seen it a lot of clients where even when they have that framework, they say, all right, well, we consider recipes to be sensitive, um, but then they don't have anything about what you're going to do with it. All right, so, so what? It, it's sensitive. How do we, what, what does that mean? Does that mean people can have it, that they can't? Uh, what, what is it? And so without this, you're not able to tie that context into, well, okay, we know it's sensitive, what, what do we need to do with it so we understand the objectives of the solution, right? So if you're looking at this, the framework really outlines what you're looking for. It, the, the policy adds the context and the objectives of, of that framework to say this is what we need to do with it if it's sensitive. And that takes us to step three, location. So what do we mean by location? This is really the scope of your data approach what to include in your data exploration, and sometimes more importantly, what to leave out. This is where you really have to go back to the framework and say, okay, this is the scope of our project, this is what we're looking for. At the same time, you need to make sure that you're considering all of the angles. There are so many different ways to get at information in SAP. You have transaction codes, reports, backend, um, if you're not thinking about your database structure. So this is a really important topic to make sure you're covering all of the bases. And if you don't think about all the data pieces, you may think you're securing, but you're not really quite sure. And at this step, you may also refine the policies. Um, based on how much information you find at this step, you, may, you have to be realistic about what can be addressed. So really that policy drives the solution and process, and you may set yourself up for failure if during the location phase, you find an abundance of information and it's just not feasible um, to reach the goals or the key performance indicators you set up in step two. So again, it's a little bit fluid here between steps two and three to make sure that um, you're moving into the solution and process with a clear vision. And that takes us to step four, the solution. This means you have to consider all the locations of data, you have to adhere to your framework of what is sensitive, and you have to stick to the policy on how to address and measure this. Is it a quick fix or is it long term? Um, we've seen clients that, based on the data found, they, they need to make a short term remediation, but then maybe it's a six month, a one year, a five year plan to address um, some of their other concerns if, if there's a lot and they're finding and this isn't an implementation, it's already, it's a done deal. So what do they need to do to fix this? And this, this step particularly is really where that ownership component comes into play. You need to have invested knowledgeable stakeholders to drive the solution. Otherwise, you, you could know what you want to do in the solution, but not have the resources, the time to do it. So this is a really critical step as well um, and, and helps 
set up, you have, a, you have a solution, but it helps set up that final process as well. And then step five for the process. You know, a lot of clients stop after step four. So maybe they start at location, they find the data, and then they come up with a solution. They fix it. What happens six months down the line? How are they making sure they're setting themselves up for long-term success? Um, what are the process governance and the drivers? Um, and, and really budget is key here too. If you're thinking about, do we need to make this into an annual process that we're checking data? It doesn't need to be a monthly review. Who is doing that? Um, and ha having the leadership support to do that. And again, continue to use your key performance indicators from the policy as a measurement of success. You, you need to make sure that every time you're running a report, you have an idea of, of what you want to do with it at that step in time. Keith, do you have anything else to add on that slide? No, Bill, I think it's, you know, we got, we got a question that came in, and I think I'd add it around this one, because it was about, is this a one-time project, or is this an ongoing process, right? And, and I love the question, and, and the answer is this is an ongoing process. But what you want to do is you, you need to establish your baseline first, right? So you're talking about a one-time project to say, this is our framework, our policy, where the data exists across the landscape and within SAP, what's our solution to protect it, and then how do we monitor and sustain that solution so that it keeps adding value and keeps protecting data. But then as you're going through you know, over time, the type of functionality you have in SAP changes, the type of data you host there changes, and also the regulatory environment changes. So there's new things you need to be mindful of and whatnot. So you do want to be consistently evaluating and reevaluating and refining this model so that your framework is constantly fitting the, your environment today and that it remains relevant. Great. And I think with that, we will turn it over to Jamie for the third CP question. Thanks, Valerie, and thanks, Pete. Um, so the third CPE question we've got, what is the area that would be most challenging for your organization for a data project? A, understanding the type of data which we consider sensitive. B, agreeing on how, much, on how to manage the existence of sensitive data. C, determining how users access sensitive data. D, designing a best fit solution to manage sensitive data or E, knowing how much to monitor sensitive data ongoing. Um, and so I'm actually going to just quickly answer. There was a clarifying question came into the chat um, regarding PII, personally identifiable information. Uh, is the PII definition that applies only to the U.S.? I know that personal data is defined for EU and Asia, uh, the European and Asia uh, Pacific countries. Um, Yes, I mean, we're not going through the definitions of, of what privacy and privacy data is on, on this webcast. I mean, what we're really saying is be aware of those regulations that apply to you in the countries and jurisdictions with, within which you operate and then use that, uh, use that to identify what the sensitive data is that you then need to monitor and restrict access to. Um, so PII tends to be a a U.S. Um, term, but it, but it certainly we would we would apply privacy restrictions as they apply within Europe and in within the Asia Pacific regions as well. Um, one, uh, I'm going to ask a quick question. Um, we've got a, we've got another question came in. Um, regard, and I'll ask our sister either either Val or Pete regarding SAP HANA. Do, do we see the risk of vulnerability? At the database layer increase uh, due to due to the the the, the, uh, the use of HANA. Uh, so Jamie, thanks. Uh, I, I'll start with that, and then Val, if you have anything to add on it. Okay. Uh, at a high level, no, right? I would say that SAP HANA doesn't necessarily change the amount of risk. Uh, what it just does is it almost just swaps out where the data is stored, right? So where you might have been using a different type of database in the past, now you're you're hosting your data in HANA. So what, what I think it does is it just, I think it increases a lens in, in, in to, to how much you need to foc focus on it, right? Because HANA itself, and generally with SAP overall, when you go in an SAP product, the best blessing and the curse is that you have more availability and more visibility into your information and into your risk, right? So it's much more exposed than it might have been in a different source. So my answer would be no, it doesn't become riskier. It just may become easier to find 
the risks and be able to either implement a solution or, or you know, whatnot. Great. Thanks, Pete. So if we look at uh, the results of the poll that I've brought up, um, what we're seeing is that the, um, the, the, the area that people will find most challenging or think they'll find most challenging is designing a best fit solution uh, to manage sensitive data. Um, I think that would be pretty consistent with, with, with what I would look at, particularly how you manage it with your processes around that. And so, Peter or Val, I don't know if you've got any comments you wanted to, to make on that, these results. No, I think that's pretty standard, Jamie. Um, again, it, it all comes back to figuring out what is your sensitive data, which it looks like uh, most of the participants think they could do a pretty good job of understanding that. Um, and then the best fit solution, I think that is where it helps to have an outside eye to, to say, to brainstorm, you know, where is all this data stored? What, what can we potentially do to, to help your organization? And, and it is where you need to define what is your risk appetite there. So that's not a surprising answer. You know, it's interesting, Val, because I would actually look at it a little bit differently. Uh, while I agree, I think implementing the solution is going to be the most challenging part. I, I would say the reason why it's the most challenging, it goes back to, um, a and B, right? You, you know, people don't know what data they have in SAP, and without, without knowing that, it's really difficult to put in that solution, right? So I think, yes, end of the game, it is tough to put in the solution, and that's the hardest part to come up with something effective. But framing up what it's going to be, I think that that's really one of the key drivers for why that's so hard. Great. Thanks, Pete, and thanks, Val, for, for clarifying that. Um, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this webcast, we were going to give some uh, stories as we, we've gone through, and I think Pete and Val have done that, and we're actually going to walk through a couple of case studies right now. So, Val, if you want to take us through that, that would be great. Great. Thank you, Jamie. So now we get into a fun section. What are some of the example success stories that we can share? Um, and we'll, we'll talk through these examples and also reference back to that the framework that we laid out um, to help bring that idea home. So the first client example that we're walking through is related to PII, so I'm glad that question came up in the queue. Unlike restrictions like ITAR, um, where SAP is not necessarily built to address that specific uh, regulatory requirement, PII does have pretty standard solutions for data protection. Um, but again, the key here is to establish what processes are used, what data points need to be restricted, and the scope of that framework. Um, so here in this example, it was a global security design framework that needed to be updated um, for both update and display capabilities in SAP. So we have some of the general uh, HR data to be protected, things like personnel area, info types, um, HR expense. But then also here for this particular client, there were additional regional re client requirements um, that needed to be fit, but still fit in with the flexibility of a global design. So the solution, uh, restrictions were used on both the task and enabler type roles and implemented based on the guided requirements. So some of these were direct PII requirements, but some were non-PII, things like info types, personnel area. We don't typically see those objects and fields being used to restrict PII information. But based on the requirement, we were able to pull in some of the other standard SAP objects and fields and help protect the information that was being required to protect. Um, and again, because this was a global design, we really had to consider if all the local restrictions were appropriately addressed, but the design approved by all of the global stakeholders. So it really was a joint effort to find the right balance there between local restrictions and a global design. With that, I'll pass it to Pete for a client example on recipes. Yeah, and thanks, Val. You know that that last one really was pretty cool. I, I think the global structure that we we put in there was really neat, and that it was something that could fit the varying requirements of the different locations because PII is a little bit different there. So obviously, it fit the organizational requirements for PII, but it also had the flexibility to adapt to really what each local market needed to to customize a bit more. Absolutely. Um, the next one we're going to talk about a lot is recipes. I would say you know. Uh, recipes is probably one of those things that's pretty common, you know, or, or if you look at from a sensitive data or intellectual property, this is something that people are concerned about because at the heart of it, it's how you create your products. So this one's specific to recipe, but certainly design specifications if you're more of a, an industrial manufacturing company. Um, it, all these different things trigger down to protecting people from seeing how to create your products and then replicating that to put you at a disadvantage. 
Uh, so in this one, it, it was a client that came to us and said, you know, we have all of our recipe data in SAP. We don't know what our exposure is, so how many people can see it? And so that led to an effort to help them first frame up what were all the different ways that people could access recipe information and then come up with a, a kind of whittling that down and classifying it into what's the ones that are meaningful and need to be monitored for us and need to be solved with a new solution. Uh, because what we did is, it, you know, the evaluation was very interesting in that it, it looked at all the different directions within the application layer of SAP to come up with how people can get to recipe data. And I, I think we found anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000 different potential ways that people could access recipe data within SAP. And so then we went through a long process of you know, whittling it down and saying, okay, you can see some component of the recipe data here, but, you know, is the ingredient by itself important? Is the quantity by itself important? And, and really came up with a framework that said what's meaningful to us is seeing everything, right? So you need to be able in one spot to say, I can see the whole recipe, or I can see how to produce the whole product, or how, how I can produce the product using that recipe. So very, very detailed information you know, to really focus it on what we call you know, the highest impact items. And I'll say this was part of a first step of a longer-term solution to go through, starting with the high-impact ones, and then looking at a broader solution that would address some of the, the, the lower impact but still risky uh, transaction codes and other access methods that were there. And I'd like to call out to you on this slide, the start of this project is really at step three in that framework, which is, which is the location of the data. So you'll see here, this is an example where it was so much information um, and really helping to go back then and having to go back to so think through the framework, think through the policy, slowed down the project a bit, but in the end it was it was extremely good result. No, it's a good point, Val. Really they started this at, at three and four, right? They came in and said, we need to better protect our recipe information within SAP, and then we went through the location, the solutioning, and, and the pro supporting processes to get it done. But it didn't take that further step back to say, what is all of our sensitive data? Is there anything else we need to look at? And also, to be honest, where does it exist beyond SAP? Because there are certainly other applications within the landscape. Okay, and with that, we'll pass it to Jamie for the final CPE question. Great, thanks, thanks, Val. So, ooh, it, it's jumped. Um, So the final CPE question, um, does your organization know what data is sensitive in its SAP system? A, yes, and we have defined key performance indicators to measure access exposure. B, yes, but we, we do not have a consistent approach to the sensitive data. C, no, but we would like to understand more. Or D, no, but we do not consider sensitive data as business critical. And so I'll give them a, a, a minute to answer that. Uh, one question that's come in, and th this is an interesting discussional question. I'm going to ask it um, uh, uh, at the risk of uh, endangering us here. Um, the question is, can you comment on reputational risk impacts and how you measure them? Uh, and I think it would be hard to ignore reputational risk simply because of the fact of how many companies are, uh, are being exposed through the press for, for, for one thing or another. Um, and so reputational risk and the cost of reputational risk is significant. Um, you know, the way that I would look at this, uh, you, you know, how, how do you measure it? I mean, are you measuring the fact that you're not on the front page of the Wall Street Journal being called out for, for, for exposing sensitive data? Um, that's really, really difficult to, to actually gauge how you measure where you are. What's critical, though, and I think what's clear and what most people agree is, it's a lot cheaper to secure your data and stop that from happening than deal with the cleanup and the cost of recovering from that reputational um, impact later on. And that's definitely how we would look at it. Um, I don't know, uh, Pete or Val, if you've got any other comments you wanted to add to that. Yeah, I think, you know, Jamie, what I would say is that while it's tough to quantify, I think it's also tough to recover from, right? Because once something that gets out there, if there's a, a brief that becomes very public and 
and something happens uh, where you either jeopardize your customers, you know, whether it's you, know, you lose their personal information or you actually put their, their health at risk, it's really tough to recover trust uh, out in, in the market. So it's hard to put a number around it, but I think everyone on the webcast can probably go and think to themselves, there's an incident that happened with either someone I did do business with or someone I considered doing business with where you know, my privacy or my personal information was put at risk or my, my personal health was put at risk. And, and for that result, I really, I really don't do a whole lot more work with them anymore because I'm nervous that would happen again or I, just, I don't quite have the same confidence I had before. Yeah, agreed. Um, so, I, I mean, as, as I said, I think that's one we could you, you could have the conversation with an individual organization to, to figure out the impacts of that reputational risk. But, again, as I said, I think that cost is uh, – the, the cost of trying to fix it once it's happened is, is very significant, and that's really the objective is to make sure that you're not being faced with that, that monstrous cost at the end. So if we look at the um, – poll results that we've got in for this last question, uh, the majority of people have answered that yes, but we do not, don't have a consistent approach to sensitive data. I think, you know, based on my experience, what I see a lot of companies and what I sort of get told is, yeah, we sort of know what most of our sensitive data is, but we haven't really gone through a formal program of identifying all of it, making sure we know what all of it is and understanding how all of it is controlled. So it's sort of a a mix of, of what we've got in here and definitely this answer of you know yes but we've not got a consistent approach to sensitive data would be consistent with what I see at a, at a, a number of organizations. Again uh, Val and Pete if you have any last comments before we move on and, and finish up the webcast. I think we can move forward. Thank you Jamie. Sounds great. So Val. All right, so now we're coming upon our last client example, and this is one for ITAR. Um, so this is exciting. The client had ITAR in ECC and PLM environments, including the classes, materials, uh, bills of materials, recipes, recipe change master, as well as environmental health and safety uh, implications. So in this example specifically, SAP was already implemented. Um, the client had thought about ITAR up front, so prior to the implementation. Uh, but a more comprehensive framework was needed. So it, some of the fun facts about this as well is they leveraged IDM tool to limit restriction, uh, restricted access during provisioning. So this is one thing they're already doing really well. So let's walk through step-by-step -step of their solution. Um, again, some of which was considered prior to this project and then some of which was done during the course of the project. They first developed five levels of export controls. So it's really saying, okay, five different pieces. The first step, this is the most critical information, down to the fifth to say most people can have this access. So this is where they really took the time to define their policy. Uh, where, where do we want to um, define what is sensitive for us from an ITAR perspective? The second step is they used enabler type roles. So this includes their security design. And these were used during the provisioning process to give the user an enabler role corresponding to one of those five levels of access. So the enabler roles really controlled all of the sensitive data that needed to be considered for the ITAR regulation. Third, the request for the enabler roles, again, was performed through identity management. And this was specifically routed to the legal and compliance department. So here's where they used their identity management solution um, to autom automatically send these requests to legal compliance. Normally, this may be a manual process um, or maybe an after-the-fact check that the compliance department does to validate that users have appropriate citizenship, have appropriate documentation in order to get the access they want. But um, using the IDM solution, they were able to do this automatically. And then the fourth step is really the critical, and this is where it all built from. And this is where they had started doing it at the, court, at the start of their implementation throughout and continue to think about it afterwards. And that's that enhancements and customizations were required um, in the system in order to enforce authorization group checks. So the core of the solution was around authorization groups. These are standard in SAP, but not necessarily standard for all of the transaction codes and reports and tables that they 
um, you know, found during the course of their location uh, analysis. So at times they had to consider RISEF, consider how to properly secure the data and make sure that the authorization group check was enabled for all the different pieces. And this is really where a lot of the complexity came in. It's also where cost came in. So at the start of this, at the start of the project, they had to say, yes, due to this regulation, we are willing to put in the time and the effort and the money to make sure that any customization um, enhancements to the system will be worth it for us in order to make sure that we can say we are 100% comfortable with ITAR. So with that, I'll move to the final, uh, final section. This is key takeaways and questions. Um, we appreciate all the time you've spent on the webcast. Hopefully it's been informative and, and fun to learn about. And really at this point, you should have an understanding of how effective sensitive data security strategies protect your organization from a, a host of different issues. There are many ways to define and access that sensitive data. And finally, these strategies can be implemented in a way that controls access to need to know users while still promoting an efficient operating environment. Yep. And Val, I would jump in and add one, one more too. If we're looking at some of the stuff we talked about. Sure, Pete. It, find a way to identify this upfront and early. So those of you considering an implementation, get this as part of your upfront requirements about how you set up your master data, where you locate information. And knowing this upfront in advance, what that's going to do is really open up a lot more solutions for you to be able to address and control this type of risk going forward within SAP. Great. I think with that, we'll turn it over to Jamie for the closing. Yes, thank you, Val. Thanks, uh, thanks, Pete. Um, uh, just brought up on screen some contact information. You've got uh, both Pete and Valerie's contact information along with mine. I uh, want to also mention Scott Osterman. He, Scott leads our security practice, so Scott really does own this space. And so if you have any questions, you can reach out to us individually uh, and we'll get back to you. There were a number of questions that came in and comments actually right at the end, which is great. As I mentioned, we're not able to get to every every question on the actual webcast itself, but we are going to follow up with each of you individually to um, to answer those questions that have come in. So thank you very much for submitting those. Uh, the last thing I just want to do to mention uh, from a publicity standpoint, our next webcast will be in January. For everybody who's registered with this webcast, you'll get a reminder. What we're going to talk about in January is, is a GRC roadmap. Um, so if you've got an investment in GRC or thinking of investing in GRC, how do you take it and get more from it? How, how do you get a better return on investment for what you've already started to, to do right now? Uh, and with that, I'll hand it back to ON24 to conclude the session. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining.